Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim Worth with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live with James Jacob Prash in England. Jacob, uh, one of the believers asked, which transla translation of the Bible do you use and you think is best? And why are there so many Bible translations? There is only one verse in God's Word of the 32,000 approximate verses in the Word of God. There's only one verse and one only that exegetically speaks in its context to the issue of translation. It's something God has only said once and has only seen a need to say once. That verse is Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. When the refugees came back from the Babylonian captivity, they left something in Babylon, their mother tongue except for the Levites and some old people, most Israelites, most of the people who came back from the captivity could not speak Hebrew anymore. The Targumim, that is the translations into Aramaic in the Syriac text had not been translated yet. The Septuagint, Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures did not exist yet. They had a big problem. One verse, and one verse only, does God speak to this issue of translation. This must be our point of commencement. The entire issue of translation must derive from what God has said concerning it. In Nehemiah 8.8, 8, we read the following. They read from the book, from the law of God, that is the Megillah Torah, the Pentateuch translating to give the sense so they understood the reading translating to give the sense this tells us two things one it tells us the priority is always on the original meaning of the original language not post elizabethan english not any other language not French, not Norwegian, not uh, Chinese. The priority is always on Hebrew, Aramaic, concerning portions of Daniel and so forth, and Greek. That is the priority. That's what God says. The priority is on the original meaning of the original languages. Second thing it tells us. They translated in such a way to give a sense to the meaning. There are very literal translations in English of the Greek and Hebrew scriptures, such as Young's Literal. They're very, very careful to be as literal as possible to the original languages but they don't make much sense for reading or for study because language doesn't work that way. <coughs> English was influenced by a number of other languages, certainly Latin, German, and French after the Norman Conquest. I could say to somebody here in England where I am at the moment, well, I was encouraged to go to uh, the south of France for holiday, for vacation. I was encouraged by my friends to go to the south of France. If I was to be completely accurate in what encourage meant or means in French when it first came into English, I would have to say my friends tried to put bravery into me to go on vacation to the, to the Riviera, to the south of France. Encourage means 
etymologically to put bravery into someone and courage. Now, colloquially, that's not the sense of the meaning. My friends encourage me to go to the south of France for vacation. No. My friends urged me or tried to persuade me to go to the south of France. That's the sense of the meaning. The word encourage does not mean now what it originally meant. Well, Hebrew is the same. If I was to say from the Song of Solomon, Ani le do di ve do di li, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. In modern Hebrew, that means I am my uncle's and my uncle is mine. The priority is on the original language, but you must accurately translate the sense of the meaning, what it meant at that time. We have two basic models of translation. The more literalist approaches, like the New American Standard, and we have the more flexible approaches, which are known as dynamic equivalent. How would you say now what that meant then? Okay. Some people would say, oh, dynamic equivalence is wrong. We should stick to something very literal. The problem is the Holy Spirit disagreed. Most often, though not always, when the New Testament quotes from the Old, it quotes from not the Mesoretic Hebrew or translating from the Mesoretic into Greek. It basically quotes from the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is a dynamic equivalent translation. It is not a highly literal one. In Leviticus 17, there is no forgiveness of sins without blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's quoted in the New Testament, but it's from the Septuagint. It doesn't exactly say it that way in the Hebrew. In fact, the rabbis will deny the need for blood sacrifice because it's not in the Masoretic. But that's what it would have meant then. This is known as dynamic equivalence. When you translate from one language to another, two different people are going to translate accurately, but they may not use the same terminology. It's as much an art as it is a science. What we can say is it is the original meaning that has the priority in the original language. And we must translate that idea, what the author was inspired to write then, in a way that people can understand it now. Now, we do have a problem with paraphrases and with inclusivist Bibles. The only legitimacy for a paraphrase would either be a children's Bible, where children are learning to read until they are able to read well enough to get them into a proper translation or in certain mission situations where you're trying to get people saved who don't have a written language yet, something the Wycliffe translators and others and Bible societies have had to cope with in the developing world very often. As a temporary provision for children's Bibles or in certain missiological situations where the people don't have the scripture in their own language yet, there can be a temporary need for a good paraphrase. But otherwise, paraphrases are bad. Things like the message are rubbish. And Eugene Peterson's book is absolutely abominable. That is John Wimber's uh, Bible of Choice. It is absolutely disgusting. It has no resemblance very often to the original meaning of the original Greek in the New Testament. Very often it has no resemblance to it. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Greek, the word, the logos, becomes sarx. Jesus is God who become a man and dwell among us. But that word dwell, katastino, is the Greek translation of tabernacled. The same God who was present with the Old Testament Israelites in the tabernacle would now become incarnated in the person of Jesus. That's the original meaning of the original Greek in John 1, verse 14. Rick Warren's theological mentor, Eugene Peterson, comes along with the, the message, whatever he calls it, and he writes, 
the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. That's what it says. This is completely stupid. It's not just wrong, it's stupid. We have inclusive versions now. We have to be gender neutral. We have to edit out or delete or redact anything that is critical of homosexuality or divorce. This is terrible. No, we must stick to the priority of the original languages and the original meaning. Be careful of the ignorant babblers from the King James only camp. These people are ignorant babblers. Now, I'm not speaking against the King James Bible. It is a valid translation that God has used. There are many good things to say about it. I'm not speaking against the King James Version. I'm not speaking against it. But King James himself was widely alleged by almost every historian to have been a homosexual in an inappropriate relationship with a young guy. King James persecuted born-again believers. Why did the pilgrims come on the Mayflower to Massachusetts? Because they were being persecuted for their faith by King James. He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible. It cites Apocrypha and it, as, as, as if it were canonical, and it also lists Roman Catholic holy days to Mary and things like this, the Feast of the Annunciation and so forth. I was with somebody who was archly, uh, he was adamantly King James only, that it was the only right one, and I was going through different passages, and I said, read this from the Psalms, <clears throat> and I read, I said, what does it say in the King James? If I forget the O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. I said, that's not it. That's not what it says. That's not what it means. Well, the meaning's implied. No, it's not. It simply says, if I forget the old Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. And when you look at this thematically, and when you look at this co-textually, the right hand of Yahweh is Jesus, the Messiah. He will bring salvation with his right hand. If God can forget Jerusalem and his promises to the Israelites concerning Jerusalem, it means he can forget his own son, Jesus. That's what it actually means. Oh no, the King James says he was putting the King James in priority over the original meaning of the original language. King James says Easter. Jesus did not raise from the dead on Easter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all say he rose on the Hebrew feast of first fruits, Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot. Oh no, it says Easter in the King James. I don't care what it says in the King James. I care what it says in Greek. I care what the apostles wrote. These are silly, ignorant people. When you talk to them, you'll find that very few of them can read Greek or Hebrew themselves. They don't even know that the King James, many of them, is not a translation, but it's a translation of a translation. The Texas Receptus was fused together by Erasmus of Rotterdam from four earlier Byzantian manuscripts. It's not a source manuscript. These people are way out of their league. They are not scholars. They are not academics, but they pretend to have academic or scholarly knowledge, which they don't have, and they certainly don't have linguistic knowledge. They're silly, ignorant people. They should just be ignored. They're not worth paying any attention to. Having said that, there is nothing wrong with the King James, although like any other good translation, it is not perfect and it does contain errors. It even calls the Holy Spirit an it. But that's a Jehovah's Witness doctrine, that the Holy Spirit is a nominate. It's not a person. He, he is not a person. That's a Jehovah's Witness false teaching supported by the King James, because the King James does not translate it very well. There are mistakes in it. Let no one tell you there aren't. 
It was put together by the nonconformist scholars under King James, meeting with the established church, the Anglo-Catholic scholars. Now, they did a fantastic job. It was very important in the construction of the English language as we have seen it evolve over the centuries. It's highly poetic. And it, 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 very often, the King James, in fact, most of the time, it's quite accurate. It is a valid translation. And God has certainly used it. I have no problem with the King James Bible. King James was not a very nice man, but the King James Bible I had no problem with it. But it's not without error, and it is not. It is absolutely not the priority. Nehemiah 8.8 8 says the priority is the original meaning of the original languages. Now, what translation do I use? I have an advantage. When I study God's Word, I read Greek and Hebrew. Not everybody can. Fortunately for me, I'm able to handle the Greek and Hebrew. I read Greek, I read Hebrew, I speak Hebrew. Uh, I can do that. I don't rely on any translation of God's Word. I just read God's Word. <laughs> Yesterday I was studying from the Septuagint and from the Keta Yerushalayim, from the original Hebrew. I had a Hebrew text, a Hebrew uh, codex without a word of English or any other language in it. Everything was ancient Hebrew. And I was I was reading it yesterday. Uh, Daniel, I studied Daniel 12 yesterday in both the Septuagint and in the, uh, the original Hebrew. Um, that's the priority. That's where the priority needs to be, not on any translation. Now again, the King James, I do consider to be a valid translation despite its language being archaic. It creates problems in both evangelism and discipleship. In evangelism, verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Go down to East London and speak to the Cockneys and say, verily, verily, I say to thee. Hey, right, mate, you're right, not. Nah. In other words, they say you were crazy. People don't know what that means anymore. The idea is to give the sense of the original meaning that people can understand it. So if you say, truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again, they'd understand somehow what that means, or at least they'd understand what the language means. Likewise, in discipling young believers from working class backgrounds or people who are not formally educated, it's very difficult to plunge them into this archaic language of the 17th century and try to teach them God's word in a dialect of English, they don't speak anymore. It's quite ridiculous almost. Now again, this is not to demean the King James. I have it, I read it, I sometimes read it devotionally. I love it for its prose. It's a valid translation and God has used it. But the priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages. And we can go further with this, talking about which manuscripts are the best, but that's not the question, and it's a very technical, technical area uh, of expertise. Thank you so much. Next question, please.